what is vermouth even made of? How does it, how do I use it? Does it go bad? Even the producers themselves at the time don't know what it is. Why? Because vermouth's history is complicated. But hopefully this will help you figure out what to order at a bar, what to make at home, or buy at a liquor store. This is going to be a two-part series giving a broad overview of the vermouth category as a whole, starting with a brief history in part one, and then looking at the stylistic differences between things like Rosso and dry vermouth in part two, where I'll explain why red vermouth is not actually made from red wine, and why dry vermouth isn't actually dry. This channel uh, is all about aperitifs, bitter drinks, and botanicals. We're doing this because Everybody is confused by vermouth. It's it's not just you. The category is a mess. But I'm not I'm not blaming anybody here. The category as a whole is a bit wishy-washy with a lot of critical information being lost in translation from Italian or French to English. I do want to start by saying though that I, I don't actually speak Italian or French, so while having done some obscene amounts of research on this topic, I'm still bound by what has been translated into English, and I apologize for my botches on pronunciation. So, vermouth is the original cocktail in a bottle, before cocktails were even called cocktails. Vermouth, and for that matter, the entire category of aperitif wines are essentially flavored wines with a little bit of sugar and extra alcohol added as a preservative. That's it. Just like a cocktail can be defined as simply a mixture of spirit, sugar, water, and bitters, bitters being your botanical flavoring, vermouth is fundamentally the same thing. It's wine, sugar, botanical flavoring, and spirit. It's the original cocktail in a bottle. I should also mention that the category of aperitif wines is often called aromatized wines, but that's just a mouthful to pronounce, so I'm just going to stick with the alternative name of aperitif wines, as it's a little more descriptive and understandable, I think. In fact, Historically speaking, before humans even got good at making wine, it was standard practice to add herbs and botanicals to wine to, to make it taste good. Tree resin, for example, was often added for its antimicrobial properties to stop wine from spoiling. Other herbs were also added to cover up off flavors. Humans frankly used to suck at making wine, so we added other flavors to make gross wine taste good. And of course, as it's always said, botanicals were added to wine for their medicinal properties. But I can guarantee you, we as a species added things to wine first to make it taste good before we even considered what the medicinal benefits were. That was just a bonus. The oldest archaeological samples of wine were found in China and date back to 9,000 years ago. These were not just wine, but a honey and rice wine blend, so a cross between a mead and a sake, basically, that was flavored with, you guessed it, other fruits and botanicals. Even in the Middle East and Europe 7,000, 8,000 years ago, grape wine was either drunk immediately after fermentation and only really transported within walking distance of, of the grapevine, or it had botanicals or tree resin um, at it to make it shelf stable and to make it just taste better. It just wasn't good, so we made it taste good. It's been hypothesized that these historical herbal wines were created because the human palate and desire for tasty food and drink was frankly greater than our ability to actually make tasty food and drink. So additional flavorings were, they were added to make the drink more interesting and to make it last longer. Now, I'm also using the term wine here pretty broadly. Wine as a category is not just grape wine, it includes mead, cider, other fruit wines, blueberry wine, cherry wine, really any sugar source that isn't grain-based can actually be classified as a wine. Although just to confuse you, there are always some kind of exceptions like rice wine or barley wine, which are grains turned into wine. So sure, 
why not? This is a really important historical distinction when talking about wine because the term wine is used very loosely in historical accounts and often doesn't actually mean grape wine, yet that's what the reader always assumes. More often than not, the term wine actually means wine made from honey or fruits, as those were a much more accessible fermentable sugar source than grapes. Sometimes it was really hard to get grapes, you know, when you had a beehive and some berries on your farm, so most folks just fermented what they had. Honestly, herbal wines were far more common historically than, than just fermented grape juice. Vermouth as a category grew out of this love affair with herbal wines that humans have, have always had. Before the word vermouth started to be used, one of the more popular categories of herbal wines in Europe was known as a hippocras, which is a mead and grape wine blend mixed with some sugar and spices, often baking spices like cinnamon, for example. This was the drink of choice for many Europeans from the 12th century to the 19th century, so a big span of time, and it is the hippocras that gave birth to vermouth. As time went on, these general spices in a hippocras became more and more defined into specific styles, and one of those styles that emerged was a wormwood wine. Wormwood is a crazy bitter herb with some lovely aroma and flavor. It's also the dominant ingredient found in, in absinthe, but the first known recipe for wormwood wine to emerge was from the Spanish doctor and alchemist Arnold of Villanova. In the latter half of the 13th century, Arnold is known to have written the earliest printed book on wine, most of which were all wines with various herbs added to them. As, as the popularity of this wormwood wine grew across Europe, the German word for wormwood, vermouth, was mixed up with some French and some English and kind of became vermouth. So vermouth is a herbal wine that is bittered with wormwood. More to the point, you can actually categorize all aperitif wines by their bittering agent. For, for example, vermouth is bittered with wormwood. Kakina, also known as tonic wine or kina, is bittered with quinine, just like tonic water. And Americano wines are bittered with gentian. If any other bittering herb is used outside of those, it falls into the broad category of vino amaro, which literally means bitter wine in Italian. I've noticed that in the last decade or so, and maybe even more in like the last five years, that vermouth is becoming a bit of a blanket term for all those aperitif wine categories as a whole, and I think, I think that's a mistake. Doing so confuses drinkers when they buy a vermouth that doesn't taste like a vermouth. That confusion makes it intimidating to talk and to learn about and to try new drinks with. I, I think this has largely happened for, for two reasons. First, by some, but not all, modern producers who are making aperitif wines and they just call it vermouth. When their drink doesn't actually contain any wormwood and stylistically tastes nothing like vermouth. If it doesn't taste like a vermouth and it doesn't contain wormwood, then it's just not vermouth. Finally, because there's just not a lot of good information easily available to the public about aperitif wine styles and particularly the most popular one, you guessed it, vermouth, it is kind of just becoming the term because most people can't really be asked to figure out this whole mess of categorization. This is why I think it's, it, it's critically important that these producers adopt the actual definitions of these categories so that when you, the customer, are kind of, you know, you're standing in a store looking to buy a bottle of vermouth, you can purchase with a certain level of, of confidence knowing that what you're buying will taste like vermouth and will make a good martini and not something you'll be upset or disappointed in. Nobody likes that. Not because it what you bought tastes bad, but because it just didn't meet your expectation of, of what you purchased. You wanted vermouth, but you got something different. For example, I see Lillet or Dubonnet being called a vermouth all the time and that just simply isn't what they are. While, I, while like vermouth, they are both broadly aperitif wines, those two brands specifically fall into the category of kakinas. They are bittered with quinine and taste different. 
I'm all sure nobody's, nobody's gonna stop you from using one of those in a Negroni in the sanctity of your own home. It frankly is just not gonna taste like a classic Negroni made, you know, with a Rosso Vermouth. It's kind of like calling an aged tequila a whiskey. Sure, they're both aged spirits and you can use them in many of the same ways in cocktails like an old fashioned, but they just will fundamentally change the nature of your drink. And if you wanted a whiskey old fashioned, but you got tequila, you might be a little upset because that wasn't what you desired. Same thing goes for aperitif wines. They are fundamentally different products. I'll admit though, any of these subcategories of aperitif wines have a gigantic range of flavor that is dramatically different from brand to brand to brand. So keep that in mind, but at least having some kind of framework like this should, it should help you get an idea of what might be in the bottle when you're buying something called vermouth. So now we've defined vermouth as a wine flavored with wormwood and other botanicals, it's now time to talk a little bit about sugar and spirit. Vermouth is not just wine and herbs, it has sugar and distilled alcohol added to it. Sugar is added to the vermouth to make all those crazy herbs more palatable and balanced. Sugar not only adds sweetness, but it balances out bitterness. And just like salt, it can highlight and bring out other unique flavors that you might not taste without it. But the problem with wine, especially historically before we actually, before we actually got good at making it, is that it actually isn't very safe, sta stable. It will oxidize, it really likes turning into vinegar or any other number of other things. Especially if you add a, a bacterial food source like sugar. After fermentation is complete, if you don't somehow stabilize the wine before adding sugar to it, that sucker's gonna grow something weird or re-ferment and bottles are gonna start exploding in your cupboard and you're just gonna be upset. Thankfully though, yeast and bacteria generally have an alcohol level that, that they like to grow in. If you go beyond a yeast's alcohol tolerance, they die or, or go to sleep. Broadly, that tolerance is about 18% ABV, but historically, this is why vermouth, port, sherry, or any wine that has had sugar added will generally be fortified, meaning it's had more alcohol added to bring the ABV up. This additional alcohol has not been added for flavor, but as a preservative to, to make the drink shelf stable for a long period of time to be able to transport it. Okay, so that's a pretty solid yet brief history of vermouth and why it's made the way it is. So in part two of the series, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into subcategories like what's the difference between dry, sweet, rosso, and bianco vermouths. I'd also like to know in, in the comments below, how do you enjoy drinking vermouth and how were you first introduced to it or do you have any question, other questions or do you want to know more about something that I touched on because I'd, I'd really love to take your questions and turn them into more videos so thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Cheers. Um, okie dokie. Make yourself pretty. Ugh. Same... What the f did I write here? And you can use them in many of the same ways. Just a little upset because that.